of Exodus and were headed out of Egypt. They're preparing. They're getting money from the Egyptians. And this is about two, somewhere it's a guesstimate, two to two and a half, up to three million people are coming out of Egypt, going into the Sinai Peninsula, what we call the Sinai Peninsula. Now the Bible says that Sinai in Galatians, the fourth chapter, was in Arabia. But all of these borders have changed over the millennia. They're not the same today as they were a thousand years ago, and they weren't the same a thousand years ago as they were a thousand years before that in the time of Christ, and they certainly weren't the same in the time of Christ that they were two and three thousand years before that. So we don't know where the borders of Arabia, we do know that if two and a half million people start walking in the desert, old men, little kids, uh, and they're just going along at a slow pace, and they travel for ten days to get to Sinai, it can't be over here in this part of Arabia because they can't move that fast unless God performs some miracle and go and poof and put them out there. Well, I don't believe God performs miracles like that just for the fun of it. He always has a reason to perform his miracles. So probably Sinai, some say it was down here in this Sinai Peninsula right here. Uh, I don't know. Most of your writers in the maps will show Sinai down in this bottom point and that Moses came out here and went down here. It was a 10-day journey to get to Sinai because he was on the mountain for 40 days getting the law. Now we're in this 13th chapter, in chapter 13. In chapter 14, they're leaving Egypt. This is the Red Sea experience. And most of the scholars say this is actually the Reed Sea. The Reed Sea experience. That's actually what it's supposed to be, the Reed Sea. And it was certainly somewhere in this area here, possibly this part of this gulf that goes up here uh, between Egypt. And we don't know the land changes, the river changes, but we know that it was. this is the Red Sea experience. That's what we're going to call it. Chapter 14. This is them leaving Egypt. This is preparation in chapter 13. They're, prep, they're preparing having the last or the first Passover or the last plague that ended up in the death of the firstborn, death, firstborn, and then, and then 13, they're preparing to leave Egypt. And we haven't finished chapter 13. 14, this is where Pharaoh's armies are destroyed. And then chapter 15, chapter 15 is a song of Moses. And Moses is glorifying God for having delivered Israel in chapter 14. And this is a, this is a psalm is what it is. Now Moses wrote part of the Psalms as well as David. There's about eight, possibly ten writers of the Psalms. When you're going to read the Psalms, when you're reading the Psalms, depending on who the writers are, if it's David or if it's Asaph, Asaph was the music director for David's temple. So whenever it says Asaph, I've got a list of the various people. Let me show you how simple this is. Let me see if I can find the P volume over here. Sometimes people just don't go to the effort. All it takes is research, if I can find it here. Hold on one second. Uh, this is how simple it is. All right, let me just turn over to Psalms. And we'll, and this might help you some. I'm just going to give you, I believe I have it here, Psalms. And this will tell you uh, in this section on Psalms out of the McClinic and Strong, it will tell you who, it'll tell you who they believe wrote certain Psalms. And then it'll tell you some that they're not sure of. Uh, 
I may have to come. Uh, and in here he says, uh, he's, let me just give you a couple of these. A couple of these. He talks about David being one of the psalmists. Psalms 136, excuse me, Psalms 86 and Psalms 108 and Psalms 100 and uh, 19, or 114, or excuse me, Psalms 104, uh, not, excuse me, Psalms 94, are compacted of passages from previous Psalms of David. Then he says in number two, Asaph is, is named as the author of 12 Psalms in uh, one, or no, in Psalms 100, Psalms 123 through 133. He was one of David's chief musicians. All the poems bearing his name cannot be his, for in Psalms 124, and 129 and 130, there are manifest allusions to very late events in the history of Israel. And then he goes in why it can't be, and it could be the sons of Asaph. And the sons of Korah were another family of choristers. Those are the choral group. The Psalms are songs. You know that, don't you? I used to have a book on Psalms, a song book. I'd like to get that back. And maybe we could learn some of the psalms and sing them. The authorship is assigned to the Korites in general, not because many of them could have been engaged in composing one and the same song, but because the name of the particular writer was unknown or omitted. Heman was author of David's chief singers in First Chronicles 15 and 19. He is called the Ezraite as being descended from Ezra. And he goes on, and he says, Ethan is reputed to be the author of Psalms 139. He is also called the Ezraite. And then Solom is given as the author of Psalms 122. And, uh, and uh, not 122, uh, 72. I keep getting L and C mixed up. And Psalms 126. And then he says, Moses is, re is reputed to be the writer of Psalms 15, and there is no strong reason to doubt the tradition, and he goes into a lot of argument over it, what people say, Jethrun, Jethrun, Jeduthrun, excuse me, is sometimes without just ground held to be the name as the author of Psalms 39, and he goes into some of the others. So this is the section on Psalms in the McClinic and Strong. It'll tell you who wrote them. Now, when we're reading something about David's adventures, what we have to do in the Psalms, you have to go back to First and Second Samuel, First, Second Samuel, and you have to maybe the first two, first two chapters of Second of First Kings, because David dies at that point. So David comes on the scene in First Kings, uh, First Samuel. 16. You don't hear of David till 1 Samuel 16. So, you have to look at David's life when you're reading David's Psalms. When you're reading, when you're going into uh, Moses' life, you have to look at the Psalms concerning Moses. Sometimes David will talk, or one of the other writers will talk about Moses and the children of Israel coming out of Egypt. So, take time, if you've got the McClinic and Strong, to go and look at the different writers of the Psalms so you'll know where to go when you're reading the Psalms. Now, where we are, we have, uh, when you get into 15, that's the Song of Moses. Then you have some events that happen till you get to 19. Chapter 19 is the, this is where they get to Sinai. This is 10 days when they're traveling from the 14th chapter to the 19th chapter. This is 10 days. 10 days experience. 
We get to 19. Moses goes on the mountain. Moses goes on the mountain to talk to God. Moses on the mount. And he gets on the mountain and God starts talking to him. And he says, take your shoes off your feet. The place where you stand is holy ground. And that book of Hebrews, in Hebrews the ninth chapter, Hebrews says, concerning Moses coming to the mountain in the 19th chapter of Exodus, says that Moses was exceedingly afraid or exceedingly frightened. The Greek word is ekphobeo. Ekphobeo comes from ek and phobia or phobos. We get our word phobia from that. It means he was frightened out of his wits when he went up on the mountain with God. And people say, you're not supposed to be afraid. He was terrified. You're going to talk to the living God of the universe and you're not going to be afraid. Something's wrong with you. When he goes up on the mountain, he comes down in chapter 20 and that's where we get the first account of the Ten Commandments. And of course, when he comes down, we'll go into that more later on in Exodus. We'll see Moses coming down from the mountain again and he breaks the commandments of God because Israel is there living foolishly and wild and worshiping a golden calf because he's been up there for up there for 40 days with God. Now Moses is up there talking to God for 40 days. Now, let's go back to the 13th chapter and let's see if we can get these children of Israel out of Egypt, okay? Now, we talked about in the first part of the 13th chapter that God says, you sanctify the firstborn. All the firstborns are mine. He said, they belong to me. I bought them coming out of Egypt. Now, you're going to see that all through the Bible. God's going to constantly say, what are you doing going after these idol gods? Didn't I bring you out of Egypt? Did not deliver you from the hand of Pharaoh, the greatest army of its day in the world. They were the most powerful people on the earth at the time that God delivered them from Pharaoh's hand. Now, where we are, I'll read, I'll start reading in the 14th verse of the 13th chapter. And this is, we're going to take up where we left off. He says, I want you... Those that openeth the matrix, that's the firstborn. The matrix is the womb of the woman. He says, those are mine. Redeem them back. I want you to buy them. And any of them that, there in verse 13, if it's an unclean animal like an ass, you either redeem it or break its neck. What, what were the, when God says not only the firstborn of man is mine, but the firstborn of animals is mine, and what I want you to do for every animal that opens the womb, every male, I want you to offer it to me as a sacrifice unless it's an unclean animal. If it's an unclean animal like an ass, I want you to exchange it or substitute the ass for a clean animal and that substitutionary death and atonement that Christ gave for us, we're unclean, we're all as an unclean thing, Isaiah 64 says, so he's substituting uh, a clean one, which is Christ. He is the Lamb of God without spot or blemish that takes away the sin of the world. Now, here in chapter 13, and he's talking about, well, let me read uh, verse 15. It came to pass when Pharaoh would hardly let us go that the Lord slew all the firstborn in the land of Egypt both the firstborn of man and the firstborn of beast. Now, anything we read in the Old Testament, you're going to see shadows, uh, which are a type of the real thing. Every sacrifice, now you, we're going to get to the temple and all of its furniture in Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. We're going to get to all the furniture of the temple. And I'll teach you some of the things, but... Nobody in the world has all the shadows now. There's not a scholar alive that knows. In fact, there's not hardly any scholars that know a great deal about the shadows. Now, he says, therefore, he says, it came to pass if Pharaoh would hardly let the people go, or he with great difficulty wouldn't let him go. God had to hit him with ten plagues. And Pharaoh was very humble because the Bible says there wasn't a household 
There wasn't a household in Egypt. There wasn't not a firstborn dead. And yet God spared all the firstborn of Israel who had the blood upon the doorpost. And they mourned in Israel. In Egypt there was a great mourning. They mourned with loud wails in the streets. So you could hear all over Egypt, you could hear the Egyptians out there just wailing in the streets. Both the firstborn of man and the firstborn of beast. Therefore I sacrifice to the Lord all that openeth the matrix, but he can't accept an unclean animal to sacrifice. It has to be clean. And Christ is our lamb. Being males, but all the firstborn of my children I redeem. And it shall be for a token upon thine hand and for frontlets between thine eyes. Goodness gracious. Remember in the seventh chapter of Revelation, the Lord says, put my law between your eyes and put it on your hand. And he says in Deuteronomy, the sixth chapter, put my law before your eye, put it on your hand, put it where you lie down, where you rise up, where you sleep, where you walk. He said, do that with my law. This is the same thing. It's been misinterpreted by people today when God says he's going to seal his people with a mark in their forehead in the seventh chapter of, of, of Revelation. And we see the same thing uh, in a reverse order where the mark of the beast is going to be upon the forehead and in the hand of those that worship the beast. That's not talking about a literal mark any more than God's seal being a literal seal. Upon the forehead was an old ancient term that meant to be in the mind. In the hand meant whatever you do, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, do it all with all your might, and do it all to the glory of God. And that's also the same thing whenever you look over there in Ezekiel. You see this all through the scripture, Ezekiel the ninth chapter, Ezekiel 9, I'll give you this. As we go, whenever you see these frontlets, we'll just read some of this. Ezekiel, the ninth chapter. You'll see the same thing that you see in Revelation, the seventh chapter. You've got to get in your mind, this is very figurative language. Look here in the ninth chapter, verse 1 of Ezekiel. He cried also in mine ear. This is God speaking to Ezekiel. With a loud voice saying, Cause them that have charge over the city to draw near. Now Ezekiel is prophesying about the destruction of Israel. Ezekiel lives somewhere in this text in the neighborhood of 597 to 594 B.C. Somewhere in that neighborhood, let's put question marks behind that, and it's, that's approximate. This would be the time of the second deportation. 605 was the first deportation from Israel over into Babylon. These were peaceful deportations. 586 was the slaughter of Jerusalem. 586 B.C. And what Ezekiel is prophesying is the complete annihilation of Jerusalem and the temple there. Okay, let, he's... He's prophesying, Ezekiel has been carried away in the captivity by, by one of the kings of Babylon during a peaceful deportation. Most scholars believe it was around 597 that he was carried away. So he's in Babylon making these prophecies. He's by the river Kibar. You can read that in the first verse of the first chapter. He cried in mine ears with a loud voice saying, Cause them that have charge over the city of Jerusalem to draw near even every man with his destroying weapon in his hand. And he's talking about the people that are going to come and destroy Jerusalem. God is talking to Nebuchadnezzar's mind. Not Nebuchadnezzar don't hear him talking. God's putting it in his mind. God says, I'll put it in your mind. He says that in the 36th chapter of 2 Chronicles. I'm going to put it in your mind to do these things. God manipulates men's thoughts. God talks to snow and talks to lightning bolts and he talks to the, the ice. He talks to inanimate objects. And behold, six men came from the way of the higher gate which lieth toward the north 
and every man a slaughter weapon in his hand, and one man among them was clothed with linen with a rider's inkhorn by his side. This is not a literal man. This is one of God's heavenly creatures evidently in some kind of abstract form. I can't explain it, but he's going to do the same thing as the seventh chapter of Revelation when you've got these angels going to come and mark the people of God or seal the people of God in their foreheads. Uh, 144,000, 12,000 out of each tribe, which is an incorrect numbering for literal Israel. It was a numbering for spiritual Israel, the church. And they went in and stood beside the basin altar, and the glory of the Lord of Israel was gone up from the cherub, whereupon he was the threshold of the house, and he called to the man clothed with linen, which had the written writer's inkhorn by his side. And the Lord said unto him, Go through the midst of the city, to the midst of Jerusalem, and set a mark upon the foreheads of the men that sigh and that cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. He says, everyone that is weary and sad over all this stinking idolatry and worship of Baal in the grove, he says, put a mark on their heads, and to the others, he said in mine hearing, go ye after him through the city, and kill the ones without the mark. Let not your eyes spare, neither have ye pity. Slay utterly old and young, both maids, little children, and women, and come not near any man upon whom is the mark. Sounds like the mark of God in the seventh chapter of Revelation. And the mark of the beast, the karagma, karagma of the beast there in Revelation. Karagma means etching etching, or it comes from the word karax, which means a stake on a boundary line. You know, I could go into the Satan. He went beyond the boundary line to eat of that tree in the midst of the garden, didn't he? God's boundary is the horizon. Don't eat of the tree in the midst of the garden. And he says, Slay are they old, young, both maids and little children, women, but come not near any man upon whom is the mark. And he's talking about having God's word in their mind. That's what he's talking about. And begin in my sanctuary. Then they began at the ancient men which were before the house. And he said unto them, Defile the house of God and fill the courts with the slain and go ye forth. And they went forth and killed everybody in the city of Jerusalem. This is a vision that he's having that's going to happen about ten years later. And look over here in Revelation. Look at Revelation. I'll just give you this as long as we're here. This is the way you look at the shadows. Look at Revelation. Goodness, I can move quick. and I, I forget how quickly. I'm not moving away from the subject. I'm clarifying. I'm clarifying what he says when he's talking about put it on your forehead between your eyes there and in Genesis 13 and 16. And then he in over here in Revelation 7, And I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was as it were a trumpet talking with me. Oh, I'm looking at the wrong, excuse me. I was looking at chapter 4. After these things I saw four angels. These are, these are the same four beasts that are around the throne of God. This is very figurative. Uh, they had the in fact, you find the four beasts, you find them in the first chapter of Ezekiel, you find them in the second chapter of Ezekiel, you find them in the tenth chapter of Ezekiel, and they're nothing but a representation of the covenant of God. Covenant, because when Noah comes out of the ark, when he comes out of the ark in Genesis the ninth chapter, God forms a covenant, with the cattle of the field, the birds with the fowl of the air, and with the beast of the field, and with man. And each one of these angels are what's called beasts. You got several times you got the word beast used. You got a set of four beasts or four angels, and they're the same thing. 
Each one of the beasts, which is a cherubim or cherubim, C-H-E-R-A-B-I-M, you find those cherubim, you find them the you find the covenant Genesis nine. You find this the these four beasts, of course, the king of the cow is the ox, the the king of the fowl is the eagle, the king of the beast is the lion, and then man. And each one of these beasts, these four faced beasts, you find them in Ezekiel, the first chapter, the second chapter, the tenth chapter. And you find these four beasts, and you find them also in Revelation, the fourth chapter around the throne. You find four beasts around the throne, or four cherubim. We had the veil, you had the Ark of the Covenant. And you had one on each end of the Ark of the Covenant, one woven, two of them woven into that veil there. So that's four beasts around the throne of God. All they are for is to show a picture of God's covenant. Well, here's the four beasts. <clears throat> in fact, you see the four beasts in Revelation uh, 4 and verse 7, and the first beast was like a lion, the second beast like a calf or an ox, and the third beast had the face of a man, and the fourth beast had the, was of a flying eagle. And then when you see uh, in, in verse 14 of chapter 5, And the four beasts said, Amen, and the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever, and the twenty-four elders of the twenty-four sons of Ithamar and Eliezer. And I saw when the Lamb, verse chapter 6, verse 1, I opened the seals and heard as it were the noise of thunder. And one of the four beasts says, Come and see. And the first beast opens the first seal, the second beast opens the second seal, the third beast and the fourth beast. And those first four seals were four beasts, and you'll see the sword, the famine, the pestilence, and the beast, the four judgments of God. And then, when it, just because it changes to four angels in chapter 7 doesn't mean it's not the same four beasts. It is. The four beasts are called four angels. Angel means messenger. Remember that. A-G-G-E-L-O-S. That means messenger. If they're given any message of God, they are God's messengers and the four beasts are. So he says in verse chapter 7, verse 1, After these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, and the wind that should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God, and cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. Right? It's the same thing you see there in the 13th chapter of Genesis, right? And, you, and then you go over to the 13th chapter. The 13th chapter... And I'm reading this so you can kind of connect it. The 13th chapter, we see, uh, my goodness, I don't want to read all this. And this image of the beast in verse 14 had power to give life unto the image of the beast. In verse 15, this second beast had power to give life to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak in and caused that as many as would not worship the beast, uh, image of the beast should be killed. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their forehead. A mark, right hand or forehead. Same thing he's saying in Genesis, the 13th chapter, same thing he's saying in the seventh chapter, the mark in the forehead, same thing he's saying in these other texts that we're reading. And that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name. You see, or. Mark means, or means, here's another word for mark or name. When you have or, it means this, or you can call it this. The mark is the name. Mark or name. You understand what I'm saying? Jim or pastor. 
What do you call him? Well, you call him Jim or Pastor. You see what I'm saying? He's saying Mark or name. Name is the word Shia, is the word Onoma. And it means authority. God's authority written on our foreheads doesn't mean a literal mark. It's in our minds. Right? And, uh, or the number, that he, no man might buy himself save that he that had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. I, that's a good matter, and I don't have time to go there. Now, let's go back over to Deuteronomy 6. Deuteronomy 6. Verse 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, with all thy might, and these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of these words of God when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, when thou liest down, and when thou risest up, and they, thou shalt bind them for a sign, oath, O-W-T-H, or U-W-T-H, upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontless between thy eyes, and thou shalt write them upon the post of thy house and upon thy gates. Well, the Jews, they had a little box that they would put on their arm, and they would, they call that a phylactery. And they'd have this verse in here and a couple other verses. They had this verse right here, these verses. And they called it a phylactery. Phylactery means protection. That's where we get the word prophylactic from. It means protection. A phylactery was protection. And they would tie that little black box on their arm. They said it protected. The Pharisees said it protects us. And they'd wrap that, that, black strap around their left arm because that was nearest their heart. Very rich. And they put one right between their eyes. See, people have got all this idea about the beast at the end of time and they got, and the Pharisees had their idea of it and what God meant was put it in your mind. That's what he meant. He didn't mean put it in a little box between your eyes. So whenever you see these things, I hope you can understand. Can you see the shadows in the pictures here? It's not that hard. You see what I'm saying? But you have to be familiar with the fact that they're there. I didn't write this down anywhere. It's not in my notes up here. I usually don't hardly ever look at my notes. I spread them all over everywhere and I don't even look at them. And I, once in a while I say, I guess I ought to read that. I'll probably read something here in a minute. Now, so whenever you see this, you can see he's talking about put it in your mind. Take my law, my word, put it before your eyes. I want you to see my word all day, every day. How long did it take God to get a hold of me to do that? I was probably in my 60s before I started thinking about God 24 hours a day. I thought about this all the time in my young ministry but not like I do now. Now I don't have great plans for the future. The only thing I'm thinking about tonight after service is Sunday. That's it. I don't plan a month ahead, a year ahead, or anything else. I just think about what I'm going to be teaching. And I think about it in the shower. I think about it sitting on the couch. I think about it. I don't care what I'm doing. I think about it at the store. I think about it wherever I'm going, whatever I'm doing. That's all I'm thinking about. You say... Isn't that boring? No, it's wonderful. <laughs> it's wonderful when God gets hold of your mind to put it before your eyes and put it on your hand so your hand will do the work of God. Lifting up holy hands doesn't mean raise your hands in the air. Touchdown. That don't mean that. <laughs> that don't mean that. That's all you get, raising your hands up. God is not worshipped with men's hands in the 17th chapter of Acts. Men's hands are made out of flesh. Holy hands to, means to reach out and do the work of God. It's just ridiculous. In fact, if you look at that in 1 Timothy, look here. Look over here. Let me show you. It's kind of funny what men make it mean in verse 8 of chapter 2 of 1 Timothy. I will therefore that men pray everywhere. Now pray means to bow to the will of God, right? 
lifting up holy hands without wrath or doubting. Now the word doubt, dialogismos means debate. Now this is funny. And wrath is orge. Orge. Now that's feminine gender. And that's the wrath of covetousness. Covetousness. And doubting is the word dialogismos. Which means debate. Now if this meant what the Pentecostals mean, God says, let's just assume it means to raise your hands in the air. Be sure when you're raising your hands in the air, you're not debating anybody and you're not doing it with covetousness. And that would mean that some people were raising their hands in the air debating, hey, I don't like the way you're, that clothes you're wearing. And I want that car that you've got over there. You understand what I'm saying? If he says without wrath and doubting, and if he meant to raise your hands in the air, then somebody had to be raising their hands in the air debating somebody while they're doing it and coveting what somebody, somebody's diamond ring while they're doing it. You understand what I'm saying? Uh, it's ridiculous, isn't it? <laughs> when you raise up holy hands, you go out to do the work of God and you don't debate with people while you're doing it. And you don't covet what people have while you're going out to help people in the work of God. That's what he's talking about. Now I go back over here. Now that we've kind of established what that 13th chapter of Exodus, oops, that 13th chapter and that uh, se uh, seven, 16th, the 16th verse, let's read that 16th verse again. Now w maybe you can understand this a little better. And it shall be a token upon thine hand and for frontness between thine eyes. He's not saying put little black boxes on your head, is he? No. For by strength of hand, the Lord brought you forth out of the land of Egypt. Keep it between your eyes that you didn't do this. It was the strength of God with all of these ten plagues that he brought. And it came to pass when, Mo when Pharaoh had let the people go. All right, Moses, get out of here. That God led them not through the way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near. You think God had a plan? Here they are in Egypt. Here's the Philistines right here. The Philistines is what we call the Gaza Strip. Here's the Mediterranean, Mediterranean Sea. Here's Egypt down here. There's the delta, and there goes the Nile River, and here's the desert over here, and here, here's, here's Israel, and there's the land of the Philistines. It sure would have been a straight shot to go right there, wouldn't it? Huh? You think maybe God had a program? I guess so. <laughs> well, why did he do that? I had a fellow call me the other day. Why did God pick one, not another? I said, according to the good pleasure of his will. Well, I just can't reconcile. I said, you don't have to reconcile the will of God. He preordained his family before the foundation of the world. He said that, and he said, our God sits in the heaven. He has done whatsoever he pleased. And no, he says, who art thou that replies against God? Shall the thing form say to him that formed it? Why hast thou made me thus? He says over there in, in Job 33, 13, why dost thou strive against thy maker? He giveth not any account of any of his matters. He does it because he wants to. God didn't want to take them right straight to the land of the Philistines, did he? They went down here into Sinai. But, and it came to pass when Pharaoh had let the people go that God led them not through the way of the land of the Philistines, although that was closer. For God said, lest peradventure the people repent when they see war, and they return to Egypt. Repent means to turn around. He said, I want to take them into the desert. I've got a bunch of evil people 
that have come out with all of Israel, some that are not believers, and I need to kill those people off. So when it gets to Sinai, the first place they go when they leave Sinai is Kadesh Barnea right out here under Israel. They're down in the Negev Desert. And Moses sends, this, this don't happen until you get over into Joshua and Judges, well Joshua actually, and sends all these men over here and they come back murmuring against God and God says, i got to kill all of you people off. 20 years old and up, everyone except uh, Joshua and Caleb were killed off in the wilderness. They were 20 years old and upward. Now, where were we? God led the people about through the way. Well, I didn't finish 17. Although it was near, but God says, let's peradventure the people repent when they see war and they return to Egypt. God says, I don't want you going back to Egypt. I want you out of there. Now, they are going to try to go back to Egypt. In fact, we're going to, they're going to be trying to go back to Egypt in the next chapter, some of them. They're going to be trying to go back to Egypt all through Exodus and Numbers. And God led the people about through the way of the wilderness of the Red Sea, and the children of Israel went up, harnessed, out of the land of Egypt, and Moses took the bones of Joseph with him. Why? Because Joseph told him to. Look there at that last chapter of Genesis. 50th chapter. Look at verse 24. Joseph said unto his brethren, I die, it's time for me to die. And God will surely visit you and bring you out of this land into the land which he sware to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. I wonder how Joseph knew that. Well, he was a prophet. <laughs> we got to make that real simple, don't we? And Joseph took an oath of the children of Israel, saying, God will surely visit you, and ye shall carry up my bones from here. And Joseph died, being 110 years old, and they embalmed him, and he was put in a coffin in Egypt. And Moses takes his bones. We're talking about 400 years later. Moses is picking up his bones, leaving Egypt. How do you know it's 400 years? That's a trick question. They were in, e they were in Egypt 400 years. The bodies were 400 years. I keep giving you trick questions. Just answer them, okay? <laughs> All right. Now, and they took their journey from Succoth and encamped in Etham in the edge of the wilderness. I don't know how far into the wilderness they are. It's in Etham. I've looked up Etham. Nobody really knows. It's a spot in the wilderness. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them the way and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light to go by day and night. And right here, you can see it. And God would come down. That's called the Shekinah glory cloud. He would come down and sit up on the Ark of the Covenant. It was a fire by night and a cloud by day. They moved at daylight. So whenever that cloud started moving, the sons of Korah started grabbing all the the vessels of the house of the Lord breaking down the altars and put it all together and putting it on the staves and carrying them like that. Guy back here, one in front. That's the way they had to carry him. All right. Last verse. And he took not away the pillar of cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night from before the people. This was a sign that God was always here with them. He said, Lord, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the world. I'll never leave you. I will never forsake you. Now, we think that these are miracles of Moses, but God won't do this in our lives. First of all, we need to understand he's doing it in our lives. He's doing what he wants to do. Everybody here is exactly where they're supposed to be and doing what they're supposed to be doing. But you're not supposed to stay here any more than Moses was supposed to stay on the edge of the Red Sea. Go forward. 
If he works all things after the counts of his own will, he works your life after the counts of his own will. If he's declared the end from the beginning and from ancient times everything that's not yet done, then as you go down into the Red Sea or go into the wilderness of this life and you have every kind of problem and you think nobody can help me out of my problem mm -hmm. and it ain't going to happen, everything comes to pass, nothing comes to stay. Haven't you figured that out yet? Nothing has ever happened in my life I've never had anything happen in my life as bad as I thought it was going to be. Nothing. And why sit around and worry about it if God is doing it? Right? In everything give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. This reminds me. Now he's about to deliver the children of Israel to the Red Sea. They're coming to the Red Sea. Remember what Joseph said in the 45th chapter of of Genesis uh, in Genesis 45 remember he reveals to his brothers who he is and he says I am Joseph your brother whom you sold into Egypt in verse 5 he says now therefore be not grieved nor angry with yourselves that you sold me here for God is the one that sent me before you to preserve life what do you think he's talking about do you think he's just talking about preserving their lives over there in Israel and bringing them to Egypt when he's second in charge in Egypt? Or do you think perhaps he's talking about bringing this entire nation out of bondage? Look here, and he goes on to say, in verse 7, God sent me before you to preserve you a posterity in the earth. He's not just talking about them being delivered from the famine in Israel. He's talking about them being delivered at the hand of Moses over there in that 14th chapter of Exodus. And to save your lives by a great deliverance. I believe that's talking about their deliverance 400 years later at the hand of Moses. Now it, now it was not you that sent me hither, but God. People don't believe in the sovereign will of God and God manipulating the minds of people, but he manipulated the minds of Joseph's brothers to get him sold into Egypt so Moses could deliver them so they would have a law. People say, why does God do these things this way? Because he wants to. Our God sits in the heavens there in Psalms 115.3. He does the things that he pleases. And nobody can stay the hand of God and say to him, what doest thou? Now let's read about this adventure. This Red Sea adventure. Let me get me a drink of water. You know... The Bible says in the 10th chapter of 1 Corinthians that Israel was baptized through the Red Sea. I thought you said that baptism was a death. You mean, and death means separation. You mean when they come through the Red Sea and go out here in the desert, that's not a form of a death to self, leaving all that behind. They're going to get into the desert and say, we've gotten out here, God's going to kill us out here in the desert, and we had all of these melons and leeks and cucumbers, and I don't know what you want with leeks and cucumbers. We had all this in Egypt, and we have nothing out here. God brought us out here to die. It sounds like, People today, doesn't it? You say, but God doesn't know my situation. I didn't really learn those verses that the Bible tell us that Jesus says, I'll not leave you, forsake you. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. And you'll find rest in your soul. And lo, I'm with you all the way to the end of the world. I thought those were just nice, pretty words out of the Bible when I was a young preacher in my 20s. I did not learn till I went through one experience after another, one just one devastation after another, that God really does take care of his people. You say, he hadn't been taking care of me up to this point. I've had all these problems and this problem and this problem. That has nothing to do with him not taking care of you. He's going to deliver you through what you think are major problems in your life and you're going to come to a place and realize those are not as big as I thought because after you get through them, you go on later on in life, you're going to look back at them and thought, what was that, a feather that hit me in the head? It's, it doesn't even matter what used to happen. And the older you get, you come to a place where nothing seems to be that 
important. Don't you? Just that it's just you're existing from one day to the next and doing your duty to God. Now, let's begin this excursion through the Red Sea in the 14th chapter. The Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel that they turn and encamp before Pahirath, between Migdal and the sea, over against Baal Zephon, notice ba Baal, which means Lord of Zephon, before it ye shall encamp by the sea. For Pharaoh will say of the children of Israel, they're entangled in the land, the wilderness has shut them in, and I've got them trapped. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart. I will harden Pharaoh's heart. I will harden Pharaoh's heart. Each time the Lord said, I will harden Pharaoh's heart. Now you're going to find later on where the Bible says Pharaoh hardened his heart. The only reason Pharaoh hardened his heart was because God gave him the hardening. It was God who said in Romans 9, remember what he said in Romans 9? Look at Romans 9 very quick. Romans 9. Romans 9. When he says, Jacob, have I loved Esau, have I hated, in verse 13, what shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid. Jacob is Israel, isn't he? And Jacob being Israel, they're headed towards Sinai to receive the law, aren't they? Huh? Aren't they headed to Sinai receive the law in that 14th chapter? Well, Jacob have I loved, loved is agape, and that's walking in the commandments of God. Walk. This is love, this is agape, that we walk after his commandments. Well, if this is agape, that we walk after his commandments, and Jacob's headed through Jacob or Israel, all this is Jacob's children. These are all Jacob's sons and daughters and they're headed out through the Red Sea and they're going to go to Sinai to get the law so they can walk in the commandments of God in the border of Israel. When they get to Israel, this is going to be their laws in God's border. And we've been predestined, haven't we? pro horizo pre-bound inside God's border in spiritual Jerusalem. Horizo means to bound and it's our word horizon means to bound inside the light to bound in the light. And Israel was a kingdom of light, weren't they? He, God says, I've transferred you out of the kings of, out of darkness to the kingdom of his dear son, the kingdom of light. And Colossians, the first chapter. Now, and he says in, in Romans 9, what shall we say then? If God loved Jacob and hated Esau, he didn't love Esau less. He gave Esau none of the commandments of God. What shall we say then? It is in righteousness with God. God forbid. For he said to Moses in Exodus the 33rd chapter, and we'll get to that, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. I have mercy on whom I want to. I only have mercy on Israel. And spiritual Israel is the church. I only have mercy on the church. And have mercy on those that fear me, and I have to put fear into their hearts. And I'll have compassion on whom I'll have compassion. So then it is not of him that willeth. It wasn't Israel willing God. When the Lord told Moses, you go tell Israel, I'm going to Pharaoh and tell him to let you go. And Moses said, what if they say, who is this God? What's his name? What Moses was saying, in 400 years they've forgotten you, God. God says, I'm having compassion on them, not because they remember me, because I have chosen them. Well, that's a very sobering statement, isn't it? Not because we know God or do anything right has he chosen us. He chose us according to his arbitrary choice. So then it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy upon Israel. For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, even for this same purpose have I raised thee up, you had no other purpose to live that I might show my power in thee that my name might be declared throughout all the earth 
When the world hears what I do to you in this 14th chapter of Exodus and you're the most powerful monarch in the world and I'm going to kill you. That's some kind of a God, isn't it? All right, let's keep reading. The Lord spake unto Moses, saying, I will harden Pharaoh's heart that he shall follow after Israel. He'll follow them. I'm going to harden his heart again after he lets him go because I want to drown him. People say God loves everybody. He didn't love Pharaoh. He didn't love his son. He said, you tell Pharaoh, let my son go. Israel is my son, even my firstborn. And if you don't let my son go, I'm going to kill your firstborn son. And Moses, I'm going to harden his heart. He won't let the people go. God didn't love Pharaoh or his son. Why didn't he tell Moses to sing just as I am if there's something called free will? Ain't no free will. That's disgusting, isn't it? I hate free will. It's actually not free will. I I love God's free will. God has free will. Man has self-will. I will be honored upon Pharaoh. What does he mean he's going to be honored? God willing to show the wrath of the people and make his power known. He endured much, much long suffering, the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction. He says, I want to show my power in Pharaoh. Watch me kill him and destroy all of his armies. And nobody can conquer Egypt. Not at this time in the world. Their death is going to honor him. His, the way God's going to kill him is going to honor God. And I will be honored upon Pharaoh and upon all his hosts that the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord and they did so. And it was told the king of Egypt or the Pharaoh that the people had fled. Well, he's the one that let them go. (laughs) It doesn't make sense, does it? And the heart of Pharaoh and his servants was turned against the people and Pharaoh and his people said, Why have we done this? What have we done? We've let all of these slaves go and they've been building our cities with their bricks, with straw, and we had all these free slaves that we have let Israel go from serving us. That takes a lot of hardening when you got dead people stinking all over Egypt. They can smell the stink at the point that they're saying these things. They haven't buried all these people. There's millions of people dead in Egypt, at least hundreds of thousands. And they can smell it. And they probably hadn't even gotten rid of all of the dead frogs yet. And he made ready his chariot. Pharaoh took his chariot and took his people with him and he took 600 chosen chariots. It looked like a lot more people than in these movies, did they? Usually got seventy or eighty something in the in the Ten Commandments with Charlton Presley, whatever his name is. By the Lord God, you know, stand there like Elvis. And he took six hundred chosen chariots and all the chariots of Egypt and captains over every one of them. This is all of Pharaoh's army. Every chariot he had. Chariots were the tanks of the day and most of them had these, they were called iron chariots and they had these scythes on the wheels that would just rip people apart. He took all of his chariots. God is going to destroy the largest, most powerful army in the world in one day, in one swipe of his hand. When people say, you just don't know my problems. What you're wanting when you have a problem, you're kind of like the people were with Moses. They want it all fixed all at once. It's going to take God 40 years to fix them. Sometimes it took him about 40 years to fix me. It takes him a while. has to beat us up real good like he did them. When they come out of Egypt, it's a picture of us being born again, coming out of the world, And all of this Sinai experience of 40 years is a picture of our fire and trials in life to make us holy before we enter the promised land, heaven. He's going to deal with us. Now, where was I? Eight. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. 
Whether you preachers like it or not, there was no free will in this. God hardened his heart. Could God have softened his heart? Well, yes, he softened his heart on the last plague, didn't he? God said, I will soften his heart and he'll let the people go and then I'll harden his heart again. God is in charge of Pharaoh's mind. God is in charge of everybody's mind. And he pursued after the children of Israel and the children of Israel went out with a high hand. The word is room, R-U-W-M. It's the same word. It's like raising your hand up. It's like, we're winning. Went out with a powerful hand. That word room is pride, proud, lifted up, high. It's the same word as ob, room, ob, brum, abram. That's why God changed Abraham's name from Abram to Abraham, father of many nations. This meant proud father. Well, God says, I'm, it's going to be my pride, and they're going to come out with a high hand as they come out of Egypt, a hand of strength. But the Egyptians pursued after them all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh. Now, it says they had 600 chariots. There may have been more. These were Pharaoh's probably his favorite higher echelon of soldiers in the 600 chariots. 600 chosen chariots. Yeah, chosen chariots. All the horses, chariots of Pharaoh, and his horsemen and his army overtook them in camping by the sea, by the Reed Sea or the Red Sea. Besides Pihahiroth, before Baal Zephon. And when Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. They were terrified. Here comes the great Egyptian army. They were so afraid, and the children of Israel cried out to the Lord, Oh, God help us. They're coming! They were scared to death. Then said Moses, Because there were no graves in Egypt, hast thou taken us away to die in the wilderness? None of our firstborn died in Egypt. We didn't bury any of them there. You're going to kill them out here in the desert? Isn't this amazing? You think that God brought you out here to die when he's delivered you from this great system, this great monarch, this great kingdom? You think he brought you out here to die? Wherefore hast thou dealt thus with us to carry us forth out of Egypt? Is not this the word that we tell thee in Egypt, saying, Let us alone, Moses. We're okay in Egypt. We don't want all those trials that it takes to get to heaven. We don't want all the fire and the trials and the tribulation, all the years in the wilderness. Now, God didn't tell them they was going to spend all those years. They thought they were going straight to Canaan's land. That we may serve the Egyptians, for it had been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in this wilderness. Have you, have you ever gone through some trials and all and you look like your back was against the wall and you felt like you was up against the Red Sea and there's an army about to run over you and you wish you could die? I've been there. You ever been there? You think, I can't get out of this? Our problem is we want to get out of it our way. That's the problem. We want, you know, we want God to, uh, we want to instruct him. I have been in trouble. What we need to learn to understand, you can't be going along, say, God, I'm going this direction, and, and I need you to get all my troubles out of the way while I continue to go this direction. He says, turn around and go the other way. We don't want to repent and turn from ourselves and believe God. We want to believe God in 1966, 67, 68, 69 was like living in a wilderness to me. It was like I had died and gone to hell. I thought, I'll never get out of this. What am I going to do? 
I didn't want to wait for God to do what he was going to do. In time, God fixes all things. There's that old saying, time heals all wounds. And I might add to that, time wounds all heals. H-E-E-L-S. That's an old saying. Now, now they're up against the Red Sea. What are they going to do? There's no way out. And people will say, Jim, you just don't know my situation. God's way out is not necessarily your way out. Your way out is according to your plans. Man devises his way, but the Lord directs his step. Moses is thinking, what did you do? God wants that army chasing him. He wants to, you know what he's fixing to do? You've heard me say this before. Until God completely disables you and you have no way out in your life to think your way out, that's when you'll learn to trust God, when there's no way out. If God will put you in a hospital and like he's done me and put IVs in your arms, you think you're dying and you think I'm not going to live through this and I'll never breathe right again. And then you lay on a bed and look straight up. All you can do is think about God. <coughs> you're having a Red Sea experience. When, you, when there's no way out. Has anybody ever been wh where they had no way out? Yeah, hmm? huh? yeah, Mary's had some no way out experiences. Been tough. She's been a single mother and tried to live. She said at one point she's living in a place and uh, they raised her rent $5 a month and she couldn't pay it. She didn't know what she's going to do. Sometimes you think, I can't get out of this. Well, God can get you out somehow, doesn't he? Now, here's what Moses says to the children of Israel. Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not, stand still. <laughs> Be quiet, shut up, stand still. Let me give you this word stand still uh, it's the word yatsab y-a-t-s-a-b this word means just to stand fast with where you are just stand in the Lord stand in truth and continue doing what you're supposed to do he says stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Now, sometimes when you think you don't have a way out, you have to be quiet and stand still and wait on God to work. And he will work. You say, what do I do in the meantime? Do I just stop working? No. What does the Bible say we're supposed to do? The Bible says we are... Let me show you something here. Go over here to Isaiah 40. Isaiah 40. People get in a hurry with God. God, hurry up and do your stuff right now. I need my life fixed. I've had a divorce. I need a wife. I need somebody in my life. I need somebody that loves God and looks like Miss America. <laughs> You're looking for the wrong thing. I need the most wonderful Christian in the world that loves God and is committed to Christ with all her heart and looks like Sophia Loren. When she was young. Forget that. She was made to take people to hell. Look here. Sometimes the opportunities come and we don't recognize them when they're here, do we? It's like the old joke about the guy's on the housetop and he's and the floods on his house and he's getting higher and higher and he says, Lord, get me out of here, deliver me. And this guy in a boat comes up says, hey, mister, you want to write? He says, no, the Lord's going to deliver me. And then later on, a helicopter comes by, and they say, come on, get on board. He says, the Lord's going to deliver me. And then the man drowns and dies and goes to heaven. He says, you said you'd deliver me. God said, I sent you a helicopter and a boat. What do you want? That's the way people are. They don't even recognize the salvation when it comes, do they? Kind of like Moses standing up there and looking at that water spread out. Well, I just don't know what to do now. 
sometimes the answer is right here in our face and we don't pay any attention to it. It's because it's not the answer we want. I want it my way. Look at Isaiah 40. This is, there's an old song that was written by this and I really love this verse. Here in Isaiah 40, let's read in verse 28. Hast thou not known, hast thou not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not? God doesn't fall back and hold back. Neither is God weary. You may be weary, but he's not. And if you're his child, he's watching over you at the Red Sea. There is no searching of his understanding he giveth power to those who are fainting and the weak people, those that are his elect, and to them that have no might, he increases strength. Even the youths shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fail here at the Red Sea. Nobody has an answer against Pharaoh's armies. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as the eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Teach me, Lord. Teach me, Lord, to wait. That's an old song. I love that old song. We have to wait on God while He's doing His thing. Kava is the word wait. Q A V A H. Let me get my pen. Q A V A H means to be patient. It means to bind together. But what we bind together with is God's word and God's promises. And he's not promising you money. And he's not promising you what the charismatics say. He's going to deliver us through every kind of adversity as believers. But sometimes what he's doing with us in these adversities, that's called fiery trials and tribulations so he can get rid of self. Self wants to set that and argue with God and say, what would you do, bring me to this point in life to kill me? God has arranged everything. Your life has been arranged from the beginning to the ending. God has declared the end from the beginning and from ancient times, everything that's not done in your life. Everything that's going to happen in your life, in your life, in your life, it's already been declared. Well, if God has declared it, why are we sitting around worrying like we're at the Red Sea and the Pharaoh's army is behind us? You think God don't know how to take care of Pharaoh's armies? You think God doesn't know how to take care of all your enemies? It's amazing to me, the enemies I used to have in the music business and in real estate, most of them are dead now. And I'm up here preaching at 74 next week, 74 years old, and I just don't have time to slow down and I don't have even have time to be angry at my old enemies anymore. They're gone. But you know what? God didn't take care of them because I wanted him to take care of them. He took care of them in his own time. He does it for his glory. Now, there's some verses. When the Bible says stand still, people say, what are we supposed to do? Sit around and do nothing? Before I go any further, Mike, how much time do I have? Let me show you a verse over here. Everybody's heard this verse. And nobody knows. I've never heard anybody say what it meant. Go over here to Luke 19. This is what Moses is supposed to be doing. You know what Moses is supposed to be doing? Are they supposed to be sitting there fretting and worrying? No. They're supposed to cook some of the food they brought out of Egypt, sit down, set up their tents, rest, and uh, talk about the promised land. Because Pharaoh's army doesn't mean anything. God has told them, I'm going to have Moses lead you out of this. And if God tells you something, you can depend on his word. If he says, I'm with you always, it does not matter 
how bad your situation is. It doesn't matter if your kids get angry at you. If you don't matter if your parents get angry at you. It doesn't matter if they don't like the truth. It don't matter if somebody's upset at you. We had a situation this past week. Mary's brother-in-law died. We didn't go to the funeral. We didn't go to the house. They don't believe any truth. We're not mad. I told her nephew, I said, we're not mad. It's just that it, he said, I don't care what the problem is. I said, there is no problem. The problem is truth. We believe in truth. We don't believe in communicating with people who don't want any part of the truth so we don't go around. I know a lot of people are not there yet. I'm not going to funerals of unbelievers. I will not. And that's not anger. That's funerals are an invention of the pagans for the living, not the dead. I'm not going to go around people who didn't want me in life. Don't really care that they come around me in death unless I preach my own funeral and I may do that and play it at the funeral. Say, I won't see you again if you don't repent. And I know everybody here has been up against the wall, haven't you? Everybody here. Let me tell you, that wall was supposed to be there. That wall may have been an army. It may have been Pharaoh's army behind you, but God ordained it. He ordained. You think he didn't ordain Pharaoh's army? God is the one that hardened his heart to make him chase after the Israelites. Didn't it? Isn't that what it said? That God hardened his heart so he would chase them? That's what it says, doesn't it? Well, if God hardened his heart and he's already told Moses, I'm going to lead you to the land of Israel, I'm going to take you back to Canaan where you're going to become a nation, do you think he can't take care of an army? Do you think he can't take care of whatever problems you have? Well, certainly he can. Where was I going to take you to? Luke. Luke, let's look over here. Luke. 19. You know, this sounds pretty simple, but God has already ordained the army behind us. He's ordained all the world to come crashing down upon us, but you think he's not going to keep them off of us? Sure he is. Notice how some serious something feels when you first start going through it, and notice how after you get through it, it wasn't as bad as you thought it was going to be. Have you noticed that? <laughs> it never is, especially if you're standing in truth. Look here at Luke 19th chapter. Everybody reads this. Luke 19. And look here in verse 13. <clears throat> well, let's read. Uh, let's read. Uh, let's read verse 12. He said, therefore. Well, let's read 11, 12 and 13. And they heard these things. He added and spake a parable because he was nigh to Jerusalem because they thought that the kingdom of God should immediately appear. Talking about literal Israel, which is spiritual now. And he said, therefore, a certain noble man went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. Speaking of Christ. And he called his ten servants and delivered them ten pounds and said unto them, Occupy till I come. You mean he's doing the same thing in the 25th chapter of Matthew and he's going to give out these different, to three different men, one ten talents, one five and one one talent? And, he's, and he means for you to go sit down and occupy, go home and occupy and sit down in your house till I come. That's not what he's saying. Occupy doesn't mean go sit down. And when we think of occupy, I'm going to occupy the house and I'm sitting here. That's not what that word means. The word is pragmatuo, my. Pragmatuomai. You probably recognize some of that. P R A G M A T E U O. Pragmatuomai. We get a word pragmatic from that. Something that's pragmatic means to busy oneself, to work. Just do the things that you need to do when you're up against the Red Sea. Ask all the old people, do you need some help over there? And the army's coming. Uh, what can I do for you? 
uh, help that little old lady. Do you need something to eat? This little boy's crying here. Help him. We don't have to worry about the army. We don't have to worry about everything that Satan can throw against us because God has arranged it, hasn't he? That's the thing about predestination. This is why it's important to preach it is so people will know that everything that's going on in your life is the will of God. It's to conform you to Christ's likeness and the things you think are important today, you'll get out of that mindset and you'll find out there's things that are really important. That's not you. That's God and others. The great commandment is to love of the Lord thy God and the second is like unto this, thy neighbor is thyself and what's important is God and others and not you. That's what frustrates people when they're young. When they're young, they, I can't have what I want. Well, no, you're not supposed to have what you want. You're supposed to have what God wants. Aren't we? Well, that's a hard thing to learn, isn't it? This word pragmatumai, pragmatic means to business. It means something that's done. If you're a pragmatic person, you're taking care of business. Means to be active or busy. That's the word occupy. It doesn't mean sit around and do nothing. So the same thing, Moses is up against the wall. He's up against the Red Sea. The great opposition, the adversary of the devil, is going about seeking whom he may devour, but he can't devour us. Because God has erased our life and the only reason he wants an army there is so he wants to teach us later on somewhere down the line after all of their other experiences, this is their first great experience and they're going to get out here and they're going to go against enemies of all kind. God says, I want to teach you what's amazing. Here comes this super army and then after God drowns Pharaoh's armies, they get up here to Kadesh Barnea, they go in there and find those Anakims in what we call the Gaza Strip, that's the land of Anak, and that was the land of the Philistines, and, it, and they went up there and, and they saw the, these huge men. They said, we can't whip them. Well, who do you think is going to whip them? Who do you think destroyed the great army of the world? And by the time they get to Kadesh Barnea, which is not too far down the road, another 40 days, plus another 10 days, plus 40, plus a few days up the road, however long it takes them to get, let's just say two or three months from then. They couldn't even remember that God destroyed Pharaoh three to four months later. Sometimes I think we forget too, don't we? Do I have any time, Mike? Six. And I've got all kinds of verses on this pragma two of my Occupy, it's the word hath done in Luke 20, in Luke 40, 22, 41. It's the word uh, shall do in Acts 15 and 29. It's the word do in Acts 17 and 7 and, and do in Acts 26 and 20. It just means to do and be busy with affairs. It comes from the word pragmatia, which, which that's Paul's words in 2 Timothy 2 and 4. No man entangleth himself with the affairs of this life. This life has affairs. So when we busy ourselves, it's not with the affairs of this life that we may please him who hath chosen us to be soldiers. He's saying, get busy while you're waiting for God to destroy the army and don't pay any attention to the army. But God won't do that when we don't believe him. He'll, he'll let us be terrified out of our mind and let the army come to just get right on top of us before he stops them. God wanted the army coming after Moses and the children of Israel, didn't he? Well, certainly he did. And Moses said unto the people, Fear not, stand still, occupy, do about your business, do you think they didn't have anything to do while they're waiting for God to destroy their army of the Egyptians? You got all these kids crying and squalling and not just because Pharaoh's coming because some of them need their diaper change, some of them needed food, some of them are out there in the middle of the desert crying, some of the old people are trying to hobble along. Get out there and busy yourself with the things you need to be doing and quit worrying about Pharaoh's army. Pharaoh's army is nothing but a fly to God. You understand that? 
I don't care how big your problems are. They don't mean nothing as far as God's concerned. He'll solve your problems the way he wants to solve them in his time. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. There's so many instances I don't even have time to get to all of them. I can't get to all of them in the Old Testament. All of the times when Israel has had their backs against the wall and they had a righteous man leading them and God would say, I'll take care of everything. I want to get into some of these men as we study this. Let me read on a little bit here. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord which He will show to you today. For the Egyptians whom you have seen today, ye shall see them again no more forever. And that ain't going to be because you're going to die. They're dying today. I've had so many enemies in my life and there was a time that I wanted God to kill them all until I learned to quit wanting God to kill my enemies and let God handle them as his enemies. Quit even counting them as my enemies. I don't even count people as my enemy anymore. I said, well, if you don't believe God, you're God's enemy. And they can get mad at me and I don't even care about that. The Lord shall fight for you. That's really hard to get a hold of in the 21st century, isn't it? The Lord's going to fight for us. How many times have I said, David spoke these words, Lord, plead my cause. The word plead means to grapple or to fight with. Rube is the word. David said, I can't fight. I've got a son that's trying to take over the kingdom. I've got a counselor, a chief counselor that's defected to Absalom's side. I've got all the world trying to come down on me. And Lord, it's because I committed adultery and murder and you said the sword would never leave my house through the prophet Nathan. And I've got all these problems, Lord, but I'm just going to rely upon you. And by the time David was an old man, he was old and weary. He could look back on his life. Look at Solomon. Man, he wrote the Psalms. He wrote, he wrote Proverbs. He wrote Song of Solomon when he's young. He wrote the Proverbs when he's middle-aged. He wrote Ecclesiastes when he's an old man. He said, I found out one thing about life. It's all vanity and vexation of spirit. The word vexation means to grasp for the wind. Has I ever tried to grab for the wind? He says, that's what you're doing when you belong to me and you're trying to get rich and be famous and become somebody. You're grabbing for the wind. Do I have any time, Mike? No. Right. The Lord shall fight for you and ye shall hold your peace. Be quiet. The thing about this whole story, it was all ordained by God. The, the captivity to save much people alive by a great deliverance, by a great deliverance, Joseph said. The reason your life is going the way it's going is because God programmed every movement of it before the foundation of the world. You say, Jim, then why do we try it? Well, let me put it this way. If you do everything you can do, everything turns out good, in the long run. All things work together for good to them of God. If you sit down and do nothing, everything turns out according to, the, to a man's life that does nothing. It doesn't turn out. It, you don't have the same results. If God gives you the desire to work hard and do everything you can do, he gives you a good ending. If he's giving you a lazy mind and a lazy body and a lazy heart, it doesn't turn out so good. But it's because God gave you that lazy mind so you wouldn't have a good life. If a man works hard and, uh, and just lets things fall where they fall, they're supposed to fall there, aren't they? If God's ordained them, then why are we taking thought for our lives and why are we stressing out? It takes a long time to get over self worrying and stressing. If you get to a place you, passing 70, I know I don't have that many years left. Why am I going to sit around worrying the rest of my life 
in making my life shorter. If I worry, then God has given me not enough faith to quit worrying. That's really peculiar to think of things that way. If you don't work at it, then God's given you a lazy mind and you're not going to have a real good result and he's ordained that too. You don't have the same result whether you work hard or not work hard. This is what we need to understand. God's ordination has to do with how he has arranged our thoughts to be accountable. He doesn't rain bread down on our front yard wrapped up in a bread wrapper uh, because he's in heaven, he's going to supply our needs. There's jobs out there. We go out and work. And then he supplies. We do everything we can do and the results belongs to God. If you don't work, you shouldn't eat. That's what the Bible says. We have to learn that God is fixing everything. He puts armies after us. He puts Pharaoh's army behind us. Can you imagine the terror that these people felt? Here's all these spears and these arrows and these bows and these, and these men sweating, these sweating Pharaoh's armies and their men in their armor clanking and they got their bows and they're ready to fire at Israel. All they need to do is get through and the great bloody slaughter is going to begin. And those people were terrified. And God says, think nothing about it. Just occupy. Do the things you need to be doing. I'm in charge of Pharaoh. But we can't get that in our heads, can we? Let's pray. Father, thank you for truth. God, help us to understand that you're in charge of everything. You've already arranged our life and all this this opposition that's around us that seems to cause us to stress and tantalize us, God help us to understand. Help the church to understand, to mature and say, this is supposed to be. God will praise you for everything and glorify you for truth. Lead us to your elect. We'll praise you for it all. In Christ's name, amen. I've never had anything crack in my life on the plane that cracked. I thought I was going to be like somebody in a airline or 40,000 feet. I remember you. And I woke up with this. Yeah, no. Bam! 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 Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm not. Uh, 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 u
But all right, it's even better. Wait, 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 Right Every time, like you got to talk about the sorrow of what they know. Yeah, yeah. 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 We, we think yeah. we have some yeah. stuff in the God. I'm Today, when it was raining in the seventh I had them all three of them. You know, text. It doesn't have to be text. You know, back and forth. You know, you didn't get the other one already. Absolutely. I don't do it. That's like too much. I don't do it. I said, hey, how you doing? Well, they're easy. I know. She got to say, I went to the hospital. And the Christian was there. And they just passed. And that's what she had. She had a hand. She had a hand. Because she was she was sinking down. I didn't see her for a while. her a message. She said, for real? You know, then, you know. Huh? Yeah, she had the problem with her. Right. Yeah. There's an apartment. I don't know. It's amazing. Yeah. 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 Don't take me for you, I'm not going to find out. I'm not going to find out. I'm not going I'm but see, when I talk to her, uh, back he's been a long time. She's like, 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 she's like,
saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, said, I saw that in our world series. You bypassed the gate. You do it by the funeral. I preached the funeral. I said, I didn't sign that. We should have gone over to the funeral. I didn't sign that. And every one of us got me going. And I preached the funeral. And I preached the funeral. No, he didn't. I preached the funeral. This is your county fight at House 100. I preached the funeral. And we said, I really believe that. I and I see that I start breaking them down. Maybe you know they're wrong. I don't know. I'm dead missing. Some people are dead missing. Yeah, they got a small I got like 50 bites. The one time I was in town, I'm sometimes it's okay if the if they if they. I mean, I was thinking about you going to If if they. Yeah, I'm telling you, I'm going to shoot a lot of You know what I'm saying? I was living over here. When are they going to do the procedure? That's so good. Wow. Uh, Jerry, what you uh, uh, yeah, uh, uh, yeah, uh, uh, yeah, uh, uh, yeah, Jerry, uh, Jerry, uh, Jerry, uh, yeah, Jerry, 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 Jerry,
I only have $1,000. And I right now put that for $10. It's a new one, eh? Well, I know I don't plan on 18 months. I would just like to get my credit card that paid off. Because, you know, that's a... You know what? You run? Jim, I might be over tomorrow to work for you. Uh, I our seal broke the in the truck. Yeah. We had a bad yeah. day. Um, and the seal that holds the black tar in, yeah, actually start leaking out of the truck. Let uh, me grab that. They get out of whose truck? Yeah. The truck was work truck that we had. Right no. It's so clear. Uh, yeah, I mean, I would yeah. when I like to. Okay. Yes. Of course, I'd like to be closer. Check your mom. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know if they have any vacancies over there. They always find out. Yeah. Here, take them books out there and I'll. Oh, wait a minute, hold on. Let me get Here. Lord. Yeah, on Friday. I'd be, I'd be trying to. I, the last time I tried to, I couldn't find my way. <laughs> well, let me show you. Let me show you. you. You gave me. I got the map. A map. You gave me the map. All you got to do is go right straight down here to the. Well, now see what it is that this right here. You know when I, I had this when I had a stroke and like I said, my directions are not like it what it was, and so it's coming back. Uh, but well, it's, it's real easy if you do what I show you what to do. Yeah, I know. I looked. I tried, but I but I couldn't. And it was it was. If you go down to the Walgreens, mm -hmm. turn right. Mm -hmm. Go to the Fifth Street that goes to the left. That's Maple. Second Street to the right. We're in the third house on the right. Okay. I'm gonna try, I got the paper. I'm gonna try it again. It's you just go to Walgreens, turn right. Go to the Fifth Street. You only turn left. That's Maple. Turn left. Second Street will only turn right. Mm -hmm. That's Irving with the third house on the right. I'm going to try it again. It's real <laughs> simple. It's I know. Like, it's like two, three, well, two. see, well, when you when you when you have the stroke, your your direction. I mean, you when you try, you think you're going the right way, and you yeah. end up going the right. Yeah. But I, I'm okay with it. I'm I'm learning. And at yeah. first, I couldn't do nothing. I couldn't I couldn't even go go across the street by myself. Yeah. And I thank God for it. So I'm, yeah. I'm getting better. <laughs> See y'all. Bye-bye.